All right, <laughs> we're back with chapter three of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. So uh, we're going to read through it, but the language is pretty complicated because you know, it's first of all, it's, it's mid 19th century English, but also it's pretty advanced. So when we get to interesting words or phrases, I'll try to rephrase them for you so it's easier to understand. But first we'll read the original. And sometimes if we find something interesting, we'll talk about it. I'm doing this live, so if you decide to watch along with me while I'm doing it live, you can ask questions in the comments section, and we can talk about the things that aren't clear for you. So let's get started, and we'll start reading Chapter 3 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 3. I have a change. The carrier's horse was the laziest horse in the world. I should hope, and shuffled along with his head down, as if he liked to keep the people waiting to whom the packages were directed. And so he's saying that the horse, the horse was going very slowly. And, uh... Wait, what did he say? To keep the people waiting... I should hope and shuffle along with his head down as if he let. So uh, he's saying he, he thinks the horse enjoyed making people wait for their packages. That's how slow he was and how badly David wanted to, uh, to, to go to this new place. I fancied, indeed, that he sometimes chuckled audibly over this reflection. But the carrier said he was only troubled with a cough. Now remember that word fancy, that verb fancy means uh, like fantasize or imagine. So it doesn't mean expensive or colorful or something like that. It just means uh, I fantasized or I imagined. I imagined that he sometimes chuckled. Now I think that's our first word that we're going to have a little talk about to chuckle. Maybe you've never seen that before. It's still a fairly common word. So he says, the horse chuckled audibly over this reflection. The horse laughed. Chuckle is a kind of laugh. So when he says the horse chuckled, he's imagining that the horse is laughing. So uh, I fancied, I imagined indeed that he sometimes laughed, chuckled audibly over this reflection. So. Uh, not only was the horse, David was convinced the horse was doing, being slow on purpose to make people wait, but he was laughing about it, and, and, and it was audible. He could hear it. But the driver said that was only a cough, so it wasn't really a chuckle. The carrier had a way of keeping his head down, like his horse, and of drooping sleepily forward as he drove. Uh, droopy, that's kind of an interesting word, and I think we'll also we'll also put that up here. Just a second. What happened to my... Is it? Yeah. Droopy. So let's take a look at that word droopy. I'm just going to see if I can find a picture because I think there was a famous cartoon dog named Droopy. Yeah, actually, if I Google Droopy, the first thing I see is this cartoon dog. Uh, let me see if I can find. Okay, this is this is a good a good picture. This is not the cartoon dog, but I think that this will uh, help you really understand this word droopy if you've never seen it before. So look at the eyes of this dog. And now, you, normally you would expect the eyes to, to be very tight, but these, these fall down like this. These are droopy eyes. This is a droopy dog. And actually, the, the cartoon dog, that uh, the famous cartoon dog, Droopy, he has that look. His face droops, his eyes droop. That means like they go down. All right. Uh, 
that's droopy. Now let's see, what did he say was droopy here? The carrier had a, a way of keeping his head down like his horse and of drooping sleepily forward. So you can imagine the carrier, the, the, the man who's, who's in charge of the horses, who's in charge of the carriage, he's holding onto the horses, but he's leaning forward and going like this, drooping, drooping down. Okay, uh, let's see. Drooping sleepily forward as he drove, with one of his arms on each of his knees. I say, drove, but it struck me that the cart would have gone to Yarmouth quite well without him, for the horse did all of that, and as to conversation, he had no idea of it but whistling. So he wasn't, he wasn't somebody who talked, he just drove the, the horses and whistled. <whistles> Whistling, that's what he did, but he never talked. And uh, it seems like he, he wasn't very good at what he did. He, he didn't drive or he was old and he wasn't paying attention, but it didn't matter because the horse knew how to go there. So <laughs> he didn't really need to be driving. Peggotty had got a basket of refreshments on her knee which would have lasted us out handsomely if we had been uh, going to London by the same conveyance. I don't know where they are exactly, but is he saying, maybe he's saying that actually uh, she brought a lot of food and uh, they could have gone as far as London and been very happy about it. Peggotty had got a basket of refreshments on her knee, which would have lasted us out handsomely if we had been going to London by the same conveyance. The same, this is just a, it's not worth explaining too much, but by the same conveyance means go, going by horse to London instead of to Yarmouth. Now he says it would have lasted us out handsomely, and you probably know that word handsome as meaning an attractive face on a man. Uh, but it could also mean, not in modern English, I don't think that you would use it, but it could mean like uh, very well, very nice, very good. So the, the food would have lasted handsomely means they would have had a, a lot of food. They, they wouldn't have wished for any food on the trip. We ate a good deal and slept a good deal. Peggotty always got, uh, Peggotty always went to sleep with her chin up, with her chin upon the handle of the basket. So you have the basket here and she would sleep like this with her chin upon the basket, the handle of the basket. Her hold of which never relaxed. And I could not have believed unless I had heard her do it that one defenseless woman could have snored so much. <laughs> so snoring, that's that's snoring. And he says, I can't, I can't believe that a woman like Peggotty could snore so much. So she was a very loud snorer. <laughs> and that was the first time Davy ever noticed that. We made so many deviations up and down lanes and were such a long time delivering a bedstead at a public house and calling in other places that I was quite tired and very glad when we saw Yarmouth. It looked rather spongy and soppy. Oh boy, spongy. Well, I don't know if you know what a sponge is, but let me show you what a sponge is, just in case you don't know. Let's see. Well, yeah, I guess SpongeBob, right? He's very famous, a very famous sponge. But uh, let's see here. This is a sponge, and he's saying Yarmouth was spongy, which is kind of an interesting word. Also, he's using the word soppy, and uh, I guess that's the name of a book and of a sports figure. Uh, soppy. Since since there are no good pictures of it, it's just some person, some soccer guy, and uh, and a book. Soppy is. Let's just say that soppy is a kind of wet. And actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll 
that's an interesting word. That's not a word that you encounter all the time. So let's uh, where do we see this? I'm just going to put the word soppy up here. Soppy. In a way, it has the same kind of meaning as sponge. When you sop something up, it absorbs water. It becomes wet because it's absorbed water. So you think of it like the word soupy, almost. Uh, so when he says Yarmouth is spongy and soppy, uh, I, well, it's on the sea, obviously. So I guess what he's saying is everything is wet, but I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. Okay, uh, we made some, well, we made so many deviations up and down the lanes and were such a long time delivering a bedstead at a public house and calling at other places that I was quite tired and very glad when we saw Yarmouth. It looked rather spongy and soppy, so that sounds, sounds bad. It sounds like everything is soaked in water, maybe. I thought as I carried my eye over the great dull waste that lay across the river, and I could not help wondering if the world were really as round as my geography book said, how any part of it came to be so flat. But I reflected that Yarmouth might be situated at one of the poles, which would account for it. <laughs> as we drew a little nearer and saw the whole adjacent prospect lying a straight low line under the sky, I hinted to Peggotty that a mound or so might have improved it. A mound is like a little hill, a little hill, a little mountain, mound. So he's saying that it, it would look nicer if there was something like this, because he's saying it's very flat. So a mound would have improved it. Okay, and also that if the land had been a little more separated from the sea and the town and the tide had not been quite so much so much mixed up, like toast and water, it would have been nicer. But Peggotty said, with greater emphasis than usual, that we must take things as we found them, and that for her part she was proud to call herself a Yarmouth bloater. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's what they call people from Yarmouth, a bloater. But uh, bloating is like being temporarily fat. Like you, you, you get like if you eat too much, then you may bloat for one or two days. That's what bloating means. So I'm not sure what it means here. Well, I, let me just Google it for a minute. Yarmouth bloater. Yarmouth bloater. Oh, it's a type of fish. And because that's what they do, they fish there. Maybe they call the people from, from Yarmouth bloaters, which is a, a, a classification of fish. Okay, so when we got into the street, which was strange enough to me, and smelt the fish, and pitch, and oakum, and tar, and saw the sailors walking about, and the carts jingling up and down over the stones, I felt I had done so busy a place in an, an injustice, and said as much to Peggotty, who heard my expressions of delight with great complacency. So once he got into the town, and he saw all of the activity, and smelled all of the smells, and had all of the experiences, he thought, oh, maybe, maybe uh, I was too... Hasty. I think we had that word last time. Hasty in my judgment. And actually, maybe this is a nice place. And that made Peggotty very happy. That's what he's saying here. And told me it was well known, I suppose, to those who had the good fortune to be born bloaters, that Yarmouth was upon the whole the finest place in the universe. Here's my am, screamed Peggotty, growed out of knowledge. Growed out of knowledge. Well, I guess instead of growed, it's grown. Grown out of knowledge. But I still don't understand that phrase. 
He was waiting for us, in fact, at the public house, and asked me how I found myself like an old acquaintance. So he, he greeted them, and he was very friendly to Davy, as if he was already family or somebody that he knew very well. I did not feel at first that I knew him as well as he knew me, because he had never come to our house since the night that I was born, and naturally he had the advantage of me. He had the advantage of me. But our intimacy was much advanced by his taking me on his back to carry me home. He was now a huge, strong fellow of six feet high, broad in proportion, broad, so he had big, wide shoulders, broad in proportion, so he was tall, six feet tall, and he was broad, and round-shouldered, round-shouldered, with a simpering boy's face. Simpering, to me, that means almost like crying. Let's see, what does Google say? Oh, ingratiating. Uh, maybe, whoops, what, what just happened? Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Uh, maybe, so ingratiating, meaning kind of like humble, like uh, deference. So he, he was really big, but in his face, it seemed like he, he was uh, very gentle. Let's see, where did we stop? But with a simpering boy's face, so like a gentle boy's face, and curly light hair that gave him quite a sheepish look. So again, uh, this is kind of like the idea of the gentle giant, somebody who's very big, but is a very gentle, soft person. And, and he even uses the, the word sheepish, and sheepish uh, kind of means shy, but it comes from the word sheep, and sheep are famously very submissive animals. So, so I'm sure that's what he meant by simpering boy's face. So he had a, a very boyish face and didn't appear at all to be as, as strong and big as he looked. He was dressed in a canvas jacket and a pair of such very stiff trousers that they would have stood quite as well without any legs in them. And you couldn't so properly have said that he wore a hat as that he was covered in a top like an old building with something pitchy. And you couldn't so properly have said that he wore a hat. So he's saying I wouldn't exactly call what he was wearing on his head a hat as he was covered in a top, like an old building with something pitchy. Well, pitchy means that it's, it's pointed. So he was wearing something and it was kind of pointy, I think. I think this is what he's saying. But I, I don't understand this. He was covered in a top, like an old building with something pitchy. I don't understand that. Okay, ham carrying me on his back and a small box of ours under his arm, and Peggotty carrying another small box of ours, we turned down lanes, bestrewn with bits of chips and little hillocks of sand, and went past gas works, rope walks, boat builders, yards, shipwrights, yards, ship breakers, yards, caulkers, yards, riggers lofts, smiths, forges, and a great litter of such places until we came out upon the dull waste I had already seen at a distance, when Ham said, Yon's our house, Master Davy. Uh, that word yon, you would never hear that in modern English, but uh, the, the word yonder you might hear, and the word yonder means over there, and I think that this is like a contraction of the word yonder. So he's saying, yon's our house, over there's our house. I looked in all directions as far as I could stare over the wilderness and away at the sea and away at the river, 
but no house could I make out uh, to make out something that's a good one. Let's put that to make something out. Maybe we'll use parentheses here. I think maybe we even, we may, did we talk about this in the last one? We talked about something like it. When you make something out, it's like you you could you could set it apart from other things. You could distinguish it. So uh, if you're looking at something far away, if you're looking at many things far away, it might look like one big object. But if you can if you can find one thing to focus on and say, oh, that's a person, or oh, that's a tree, that's making out a tree, or making out a person, it means it means um, you can see it against everything else. It's distinguished. It's, you can see it separately. So here he's looking and he says, I don't see a house. I, I can't make out a house, meaning there are other things. He sees a lot of things, but in all of those things, he doesn't see a house. Where does he say that? Yon's our house, Master Davy. I looked in all directions as far as I could see. But no house could I make out, meaning I, I, I saw a lot of different things, but no house. There was a black barge or some other kind of super, super annuated boat. What does that mean, super annuated? Maybe I'm not saying that right. Let's see, super annuated. Super annuated. obsolete that's i don't i've never heard anybody use that word in my life but so this is an obsolete boat is an old boat superannuated boat there was a black that's what a barge is a barge is a type of boat there was a black barge or some kind of superannuated boat so some kind of old unrecognizable boat not far off high and dry on the ground with an iron funnel sticking out of it for a chimney and smoking very cozily. But nothing else in the way of a habitation that was visible to me. So we've got this word cozy. Cozy. Cozy is a nice word. That means comfortable. So when you hear the word cozy, it means nice and warm and comfortable. So a cozy fire is a very nice, warm, comfortable fire. A cozy night in bed, you have all of your blankets. It's very nice and comfortable and cozy. That's what cozy means. And here, how did he use cozy? He said, uh, there was an iron funnel sticking out for a chimney and smoking very cozily. So he saw the smoke coming from the boat and he thought, oh, that looks nice. That looks nice and warm and comfortable. I'm sh or he's imagining it's nice and warm and comfortable in there. But nothing else in the way of a habitation that was visible to me. That's not it, said I, that ship-looking thing. That's it, Master Davy, returned Ham. If it had been Aladdin's palace, Roke's egg, and all, I suppose, I could not have been more charmed with the romantic idea of living in it. There was a, a delightful door cut in the side, and it was roof and it was roofed in, and there was a little window there were uh, and there were little windows in it. But the wonderful charm of it was that it was a real boat which had no doubt been upon the water hundreds of times, and which had never been intended to be lived in or on dry land. That was the captivation of it to me. If it had ever been meant to be lived in, I might have thought it small or inconvenient or lonely. But never having been designed for any such use, it became the perfect abode. Abode is just another word for a place where you can live. It was beautifully clean inside and as tidy as possible. There was a table and a Dutch clock and a chest of drawers 
and on the chest of drawers there was a tea tray with a painting on it of a lady with a parasol. A parasol is, is a lady's umbrella, usually for protection against the sun. Taking a walk with a military-looking child who was trundling a hoop. The tray was kept from tumbling down by a Bible, and the tray, if it had tumbled down, would have smashed a quantity of cups and saucers and a teapot that were grouped around the book. Tumble down. Let's, let's put that up here. Tumble down. All right, let's see if I can find a picture. Tumble. Let's see what kind of thing, what kind of images we get with tumble. Okay, this is a, this is a, a good, uh, now this is not tumble down, this is tumble. But you can get the idea of what tumbling is. It's, it's kind of like moving in a circular motion that's tumbling. So, but when you add the word down, tumble down, then that's kind of like fall down. Maybe, maybe you've heard that one before, fall down. Except the difference between fall down and tumble down is the movement. So when something tumbles down, it also moves in a circle like this. So uh, he's talking, he's describing this tray that he sees that's sitting, sitting up against the wall and something is holding it in place. But if a Bible, there's a Bible sitting there holding it in place. If the Bible wasn't there, the tray would fall and tumble down, tumble down to the floor. Okay, let's see. Let's read through that again. The tray was kept from tumbling down. So the tray was prevented or stopped from tumbling down because there was a Bible sitting on the table. So you have the tray standing up like, like this. And then you have the, uh, wait, <laughs> then you have the Bible sitting here, holding it up against the wall. If it had tumbled down, it would have smashed a quantity of cups and saucers and a teapot that were grouped around the book. So he's looking at a table and there's a tray standing up on its side. And then there's a Bible holding it. And, and then next to the Bible are some cups with tea. So if the tray did fall, it would destroy all the teacups and the tea and the little, the little tray that was set out. Let's see. On the walls, there were some common colored pictures framed and glazed of scripture subjects, such as I have never seen since in the hands of peddlers, without seeing the whole interior of Peggotty's brother's house again at one view. On the walls, there were some common colored pictures framed and glazed of scriptures. So uh, if you don't know what that means, I mean, if you speak a, a Latin language like French or Spanish, probably it's the same thing. But uh, scripture means uh, like scenes from the Bible or it really means writings from the Bible. But he's saying scripture subjects. So there were plates on the wall that had pictures of scenes from the Bible on it. And he says he's never seen anything like that, such as I have never seen since in the hands of peddlers. To peddle something is to sell something. And peddlers are people who walk in the streets, usually. Maybe they have a shop, but I think it's more for, for, for people walking in the streets or trying to sell things in the streets. Without seeing the whole interior of Peggy, Peggy's brother's house again at one view, so he's saying the only time you would see that many plates with biblical scenes on it would be from a peddler. <laughs> I don't think that's a compliment. I'm not sure if that's a compliment. <laughs> so either you go to see a peddler and you'll see all of these pictures or Peggy's brother's house. <laughs> Abraham in red going to sacrifice Isaac in blue. Now he's describing the, the, the different Bible scenes on the plates. Uh, and Daniel in yellow, cast into the den of lions, den of green lions, were the most prominent of these. Over the little mantel shelf 
was a picture of the Sarah Jane Lugger, built at Sunderland, with a real little wooden stern stuck onto it. With a real little wooden stern stuck onto it. So there was a picture of a boat, which was named the Sarah Jane Lugger, built at Sunderland, with a real little wooden stern. I think the stern is like the front of the boat. And there was actually a, a real little stern model on the picture, like a three dimension, <laughs> like a 19th century version of a three dimensional picture, I guess. A work of art combining, combining com composition with carpentry. Carpentry, a carpenter is somebody who works with wood. So he would make cabinets or anything, furniture, anything made of wood is what a carpenter would do. So this is uh, combining composition, combining painting, and carpentry and woodwork because somebody made a little model of the front of a boat and put it on the picture. Which I consider to be one of the most enviable possessions that the world could afford. So he thought it was amazing. He loved that picture. There were some hooks in the beams of the ceiling, the use of which I did not divine then. You might have seen this word divine before, meaning amazing or fantastic or something like that from heaven, really, is what it kind of means. And uh, But also divine as a verb could mean to predict or tell the future or to, to uh, receive something in a spiritual way or a psychic way. It really means guess. It could be used in that way. Not in modern English. I don't think people in modern English would say that. But uh, here he is using it like that. Where, what did he say? There were some hooks in the beams of the ceiling, the use of which I did not divine then. So uh, I didn't guess it then. I, I didn't know what they were and I, I couldn't guess. And some lockers and boxes and conveniences of that, sh uh, of that sort, which served for seats and eked out the chairs. To eke out. I want Google. I mean, I know what it means, but and it's an interesting. I'm, I'm going to put that up here, and we'll read it again too. To eke out. <laughs> I don't know how advanced you are if you're watching this. But no matter how advanced you are, I bet you've never seen this before. To eke out. Although it's used sometimes. Oh, except I've misspelled it. So let me change let me change it. I don't use it. Well, maybe I have actually used it, but I've certainly have never written it. To eke out. And I'm not even sure how to explain it, so I'm just cheating and looking at the Google definition here. Uh, to get to get by with difficulty or a struggle. Okay, so it's kind of like surviving. Uh, the time that you would use it, it's usually used with the word living. To eke out a living means to find a way to survive, to find a way to make money that's not easy. So now that makes more sense to me why, why we say to eke out a living means it's really hard for you to find money just to just to feed yourself and pay the rent to eke out a living. And to eke out means, or to eke, to, to eke out means uh, to, to get by with difficulty or a struggle. And what do we have here? Where, where did he say that? Uh, and some locker, so, so he's describing the boat and he says, uh, he's describing one corner, and he says that there were lockers and boxes and conveniences of that sort, which served for seats. So these were storage boxes, but also they used them like chairs uh, and eked out the chairs. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking like in a difficult space. Maybe that's what he means. In a difficult space, you could use them like chairs, and that's what they did. 
That's what I'm going with. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me, but that's what I'm going with. Okay, all this I saw in the first glance after I crossed the threshold. Childlike, according to my theory. And then Peggotty opened a little door and showed me my bedroom. It was the completest and most desirable bedroom ever seen in the stern of the vessel. Remember, I think the stern is like the front. It's not really that important, but let's just make sure. Stern. Oh, we better say boat stern because stern means other things. Uh, let's see. But they don't really... Oh, you see, I'm, I'm glad that I checked because actually it's the opposite. The stern is the back of the boat. So here's the stern of the boat. I was thinking it was the front. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad I checked. Okay. Well, let's keep going. All this I saw in the first glance after I crossed the threshold. Childlike, according to my theory. And then Peggotty opened a little door and showed me my bedroom. It was the completest and most desirable bedroom ever seen. In the stern of the vessel, in the back of the boat. With a little window where the rudder used to go through. And a little looking glass. Just the right height for me nailed against the wall, and framed with oyster shells. A little bed, which there was just room enough to get into, and a nosegay of seaweed in a blue mug on the table. A nosegay, I think that's a bouquet of flowers. I think that they used that term in the last chapter. Yeah. So a nosegay, this is a nosegay, but we already looked at this in the last, it's, it's a, it's like a grouping of flowers. No, but I, I've never heard anybody say that. I think that that's a Victorian term. And uh, now you would just say a bouquet of flowers. And that's like an arrangement of flowers. But oh, and, and seaweed, if you don't know what that is, although it's popular to eat now is uh, is this. So we'll just get a picture of seaweed here just to make sure we know what that is. So that's seaweed. So he was saying that there was a little nosegay of seaweed. So there was like a group of seaweed as a decoration next to his bed. That sounds interesting. I think I would like that room. I think I agree with Davy. I would like that room. All right, where did we stop? A little bed, which there was just room enough to get into, and a nosegay of seaweed in a blue mug on the table. The walls were whitewashed, as white as milk, and the patchwork counterpane made my eyes quite ache with its brightness. One thing I particularly noticed in this delightful house was the smell of fish, which was so searching that when I took out my pocket hand handkerchief to wipe my nose, I found it smelt exactly if it had been wrapped up in a lobster. So the smell of fish was so strong that even, even his clothes started smelling like fish. On my imparting this discovery and confidence to Peggotty, she informed me that her brother dealt in lobsters, crabs, and crawfish, and I afterwards found that a heap of these creatures in a st and I afterwards found that a heap of these creatures in a state of wonderful conglomeration with one another and never leaving off pinching whatever they laid hold of were usually to be found in a little wooden. I'm not sure what that word is. I can't read it. Cut house? Cub house. Oh, cub house. 
where the pots and kettles were kept. I'm only guessing that that's cup house because I can't read that word. But let me show you something else that you might know or that you might have seen or that you might use in your own life and tell you what the name of it is and then tell you and then maybe it will be obvious to you why I think that's cub house. So if you go to school, you know, remember primary school or something like that, maybe you had something like this in the classroom and you could put your things in there or uh, yeah, you know, all sorts of things. The, the, what you would call this is a cubby hole. A cubby. Maybe, maybe in the UK they just say cub house. I don't know. But I don't think so. I think that probably they don't use that term anymore. But let me just put cubby hole up here for you. So you can see what it looks like. So I think cub house, especially after what he describes about it, is like the 19th century version of a cubby hole. Because you see, that looks like a bee. I'm pretty sure that's a bee. But maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. So he's saying, I, I, whenever uh, I could always see these lobsters and crabs in a little wooden cub house where the pots and kettles were kept. So there was an area like that picture I showed you where they would put the the pots and pans and everything. But there was one place where uh, they kept the lobsters. Okay, sorry, I got distracted for a minute. Okay, let's see, let's go back. To the text. We were welcomed. We were welcomed, curtsying at the door when I was uh, on Ham's back, about a quarter of a mile off. Likewise, by a most beautiful little girl, or I thought her so, with a necklace of blue beads, who wouldn't let me kiss her when I offered to, but ran away and hid herself. By and by, when we had dined in a sumptuous manner off boiled dabs, melted butter, potatoes with a chop for me. A hairy man with a very good-natured face came home. Okay, but I just want to remind you that by and by is another way of saying later. And we've already seen that several times in the other chapters. By and by, later, later on, or at some other time, when we had dined in a sumptuous manner. Sumptuous manner means uh, like very luxurious manner. Off boiled dabs. I have no idea what a boiled dab is. What happens if I Google boiled dab? It's some kind of fish and maybe something to do with eggs. <laughs> Sand dab. Yeah, it's, I guess it's a kind of fish. Boiled dabs. Okay, melted butter and potatoes with a chop for me, with a chop for me. A hairy man with a good-natured face came home, as he called Peggotty Lass. And maybe you don't know this, but but Lass, you may have heard, uh, especially in the UK, the, the the use of the word lad, meaning boy. That's still a, a very popular word that, that's used quite a bit. Well, Lass is the girl equivalent of lad. So a lassie or a lass is a girl. And, and so this man with the beard, when, when he came in, he didn't call Peggotty Peggotty. He called her Lass. So, uh, and he called Peggotty Lass and gave her a hearty smack on the cheek. Now, maybe you know that smack. Oh, let's, let's, actually, let's write this down. This is kind of funny. This is, interest, this is an interesting one, actually. Okay, so maybe, maybe you've seen that word smack before. Probably not like this, though. Smack means like a like a slap, so that's a, a smack. But it's that it's really more about that sound. So for example, if you do this, that's smacking your lips. So did you ever see somebody eating food? They eat like in a very bad way. Uh, you might say, stop it, stop smacking your lips. That's disgusting, it's making me sick. 
<laughs> so think about that sound. You can use smack to mean kiss because it's the same it's the same movement of the lips and it's the same sound as smacking your lips when you're eating. So it's kind of a cute word for a kiss. And so he it says as he called Peggotty a lass and gave her a hearty smack on the cheek. So he gave her a big kiss on the cheek, a big on the cheek. I had no doubt from the general propriety of her conduct that he was her brother. So he's saying from her reaction, it was obvious because this big man came and gave her a kiss and she it was OK with her. She wasn't offended or angry so he could he 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 realized that must be her brother uh, and so he turned out being presently introduced to me as mr peggotty the master of the house glad to see you sir said mr peggotty you'll find us rough sir you'll find it but you'll find us ready so rough and ready is an expression meaning, you know, maybe we're not the best, but uh, we can get the job done is kind of what rough and ready means. So we're not we're not the best, but we can get the job done. And that's what he's saying here. You'll find us rough. OK, this is not a fancy place like you're used to, but you'll find us ready. But you'll you'll enjoy our company. You'll you'll find that we're good people. I thanked him and replied I was sure I should be happy in such a delightful pe place. How's your ma, sir, said Mr. Peggotty. Did you leave her pretty jolly? Uh, jolly is another word for happy. So uh, when you left her, was she happy? Was she in, in, in a good mood? I gave Mr. Peggotty to understand that she was as jolly as I could wish and that she desired and that she desired her compliments which was a uh, polite fiction on my part. I gave Mr. Peggotty to understand that she was as jolly as I could wish. She wasn't jolly. She wasn't happy. Remember, she was crying when he left. And that she desired her compliments. I'm not sure about that line. And that she desired her compliments, what that means. Which was a polite fiction. Uh, maybe... Because, you know, it used to be like you could say, send my regards, send my compliments. Send my compliments means uh, say hello to these people. Uh, maybe that's what he means by she desired her compliments. That it, she, she said, oh, make sure that you say hello to everybody for me. But she didn't really do that. He says it was a polite fiction. Fiction means something that isn't true. So uh, a polite fiction is... He, he had to lie and say that she did these things, even though she didn't. Yeah, I think that's what it means, because his, what, what he says after that is, I'm much obliged to her, I'm sure. So, you know, she said, oh, tell, tell Ham, I said, or not Ham, the brother, Mr. Peggotty. Tell Mr. Peggotty I said hello. She never did that. She should have, but she, did, she didn't. And uh, so now he's saying, oh, tell her I'm th uh, I say thank you. I'm much obliged to her, I'm sure, said Mr. Peggotty. Well, sir, if you can make out here fur, fur, okay, oh no. he they're, they're spelling the English like the way it should sound for his particular region. I'm not going to try to imitate it, but uh, <laughs> let me try to translate it. Well, sir, if you can make out here for a fortnight, so if you can stay here, if you could manage to stay here, if you can tolerate this place for two weeks, long with her, nodding at his sister, and Ham and little Emily, we should be proud of your company. So he's saying, if you can, if you can tolerate being with us, with me and, and Ham and, and Peggotty and Emily, then we'll, we'll be very happy to have you here. Having done the honors of his house in this hospitable manner, Mr. Peggotty went out to wash himself in a kettle full of hot water, remarking that cold 
would never get his muck off. <laughs> so muck is a type of wet dirt. Let's take a look at that word muck. Actually, let me, I'm going to put that word up on the screen. Muck. Muck. That's kind of like a muddy, wet dirt. So imagine he's a fisherman and he's out at sea all day. He must get really wet and dirty. Let's find a picture of muck. Oh no, it's a, it's, it's a movie. So you get all these things about movies, but here I found a mucky picture for you. So that, I mean, he did, I'm sure he didn't look like that, but, uh, you know, something like that. That's, that's the idea of muck. Oh, you know, this is probably a better, a better image. Not such an exaggeration. This is mucky. This is a, a mucky day, mucky weather. It's that kind of dirt. Okay, let's go back. Having done the honors of his house in his hospitable manner, Mr. Peggotty went out to wash, the, uh, to wash himself in a kettle full of hot water, remarking, "Cold water would never get his muck off." So, if he used cold water, it wouldn't have cleaned him really. So he had to use very hot water to get all that dirt off of him. He soon returned, greatly improved in appearance. But so rubicund, oh boy, now that's a word I've never seen before, rubicund. What does that mean, rubicund? You never have to worry about this word. You'll never see it again, probably. Actually, wait, rubic, oh, I spelled it wrong. Okay, uh, well, that word ruby means red. And so uh, rubicund means like a, a red complexion. So, you know, he just washed his face with very hot water. So, uh, and plus he was maybe out in the cold. So all, all of that made his face very red. And the word they're using here is rubicund, but I've never, I've never seen that in my, in my life. He returned greatly improved in appearance, but so rubicund that I couldn't help thinking his face had this in common with the lobsters, crabs, and crawfish. So he's saying he his face was so red that he thought uh, it was very similar to the lobsters and the crabs and the crawfish. That it went into hot water very black and came out very red. Yeah, you see, so uh, maybe a, a lobster or a crab is black and then you put it in the boiling water and when you take it out, it's very red. And the same thing happened to Mr. Peggotty. <laughs> He came in very black and dirty and mucky, and then he, he washed his face with very hot water, and then he was as red as a lobster. Okay, after tea, when the door, when the door was shut and all was made snug, the night's being cold and misty now, snug. It's funny that Dickens is using all of these words like cozy and snug. When talking, uh oh, let me let me write that again. I made it disappear. So remember the cozy fire. You know, you see the fire, and you have these nice, comfortable, warm feelings. Oh, it must be so nice inside of there with the cozy fire, because cozy means like nice and warm and comfortable. But so does snug. Snug means something very similar to that. So it's a it's a very nice word. It means that you're nice and comfortable and warm and and, you, and maybe you feel loved. You know, it's a it's a nice word to be snug. That's a good feeling. Snug. Comfortable, like you fit. Okay. Uh so after tea after tea when the door was shut and all was made snug. So uh the house was made to feel very comfortable. Maybe they put a fire and maybe you could still smell the nice food. And it was just a warm 
lovely atmosphere. The nights being cold and misty now, it seemed to me that the most delicious retreat that the imagination of man could conceive. It seemed to me the most delicious retreat that the imagination of man could conceive. So a retreat is a type of place where you go to hide or to to relax, something like that. And so he's calling this place a retreat. It's a place where you could go and uh, not be bothered. And uh, he couldn't imagine a, a better place in the world. That's what he's saying. Okay, to hear the wind getting up out at sea, to know the fog was creeping over the desolate flat outside, and to look at the fire and think that there was no house near but this one. This one, and this one, a boat, it was like enchantment. So that's the thing, uh, I think, I don't know, if, if you live in a cold place, then maybe you know what that feeling is like when there's a horrible storm outside and you can hear the wind and the snow and it, it, it's really horrible outside, but you're so nice and warm and comfortable in your home. And that's a really wonderful feeling that I think you can only experience if you live somewhere cold. <laughs> you don't know what that's like if you live in a hot place, but if you live in a cold place, that's a that's one of my favorite feelings. And so that's kind of what he's describing here, except he's in a boat. Okay, let's see. Little Emily had overcome her shyness and was sitting by my side upon the lowest and least of the lockers, which was just large enough for us two and just fitted into the chimney corner. Mrs. Peggotty, with the white apron, was knitting on the opposite side. So we have this picture. Can we look at the picture for a minute? Let's see. So here's a depiction of the inside of the boat. Well, I like it. I would like to live there. I would be happy living there. That sounds like a wonderful place to be. <laughs> Except I don't like the smell of fish. I wouldn't like that. And underneath it says, I am hospitably received by Mr. Peggotty. And then we have the picture here. Okay. Let me... All right, so Mrs. Peggotty, with the white apron, was knitting on the opposite side of the fire. Peggotty, at her needlework, was as much at home with St. Paul's and the bit of wax candle as if they had never known any other roof. So remember, she has her sewing kit with the pictures on it that, that he was fascinated by when he was at home and now she has that same thing on the boat and it almost feels like the same thing it feels like they're home ham who had been giving me my first lesson in all fours was trying to recollect a scheme of telling fortunes with the dirty cards okay i have no idea uh, maybe all fours is a card game. It sounds like it because he's talking about cards. I don't know why he's talking about dirty cards. Uh, let's see. Ham, who had been giving me my first... So he was... Ham was teaching him how to play a card game, I think. I'm not sure what all fours is. Was trying to recollect a scheme of telling fortunes with the dirty cards and printing off fishy impressions of his thumb on all of the cards he turned. Okay, so they're playing a game of cards and he's trying to make a game of uh, trying to predict the future with the cards. I don't know why he's calling them dirty cards. Maybe because Ham was still dirty. You know, he's a fisherman. He, because he says that they were, uh, he left fishy impressions on the cards. So maybe as he touched the cards, <laughs> they became dirty and fishy. I guess. I don't know. Mr. Peggotty was smoking his pipe. I felt 
it was a time for conversation and confidence. Mr. Peggotty, says I. Sir, says he. Did you give your son the name Ham because you live in a sort of ark? <laughs> so if you don't know biblical stories, you know, there's the story of Noah's ark. The, the world is ending and there's one man and his family uh, on a boat and the rest of the world floods. And one of the children's names was Ham. Mr. Peggotty seemed to think, in a, uh, think it in a deep idea, but answered, No, sir, I never gave him no name. Who gave him the name then, said I, putting the question number two of the catechism to, mis to Mr. Peggotty. Why, sir, his father give it to him, said Mr. Peggotty. I thought you were his father. My brother Joe was his father said Mr. Peggotty. Dead, Mr. Peggotty? I hinted after a respectful pause. Drowned, said Mr. Peggotty. I shouldn't laugh, but I don't know if that was supposed to be a joke or not, because it should be drowned. But uh, he says drowned dead, and I don't know. It just seems like it's a joke. Okay. I was very much surprised that Mr. Peggotty was not Ham's father and began to wonder whether I was mistaken about his relationship to anybody else there. I was so curious to know that I made up my mind to have it out with Mr. Peggotty. Okay, to have it out with someone. To have it out with someone. A lot of times, this can mean to have a, a fight with someone. That's not what he means here. But, but probably the time when you'll hear it is about having a fight with somebody. And usually it's because pressure is built. You know, somebody is doing something that's making you angry over time. And the pressure keeps building up and suddenly you release all of your anger at one point. That's having it out with someone. Here, I think what it means is... To, to extract the story, to get the full story. Come on, give me... You know, sometimes when uh, you want someone to, to make a confession or tell you a secret, you say, out with it. Come on, out with it. That means, tell me. You know, get it out of yourself. And I think that's kind of how having out is used here. I, I wanted to have it out with him means I want the secret. I want all of the details, all of the information. So I felt difficulty of resuming the subject, but had not got to the bottom. Oh, and to get to the bottom of something, that's also an interesting expression. You know, sometimes these things, they're sneaky because to get to the bottom of something. To get to the bottom of something means to find the source of something or to to find the origin of something or to to find the original uh, the the the, the, or, the 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 place where something comes from so when he says the father is dead davy wants to get to the bottom of it he wants to know what happened that's that's what it means here like, do an investigation and find out what happened. So I felt difficulty in resuming the subject, but had not got to the bottom of it yet and must attain the bottom somehow. So I said, Haven't you any children, Mr. Peggotty? No, master, he answered with a short laugh. I am a bachelor. Wait, what did he say? A bachelor. <laughs> Why is he saying bachelor? Is that a real word or is that just the way he talks? Oh yeah, it is. It's not a real word. So he's not sure how to say that word. So he says, I'm a bachelor. And then Davy says, a bachelor? I said astonished. Why, who, 
Why, who's that, Mr. Peggotty? Pointing to the person in the apron who was knitting. That's Mrs. Gummidge, said Mr. Peggotty. Gummidge, Mr. Peggotty. But at this point, Peggotty, I mean my own peculiar Peggotty, made such impressive motions to me not to ask any further questions that I could only sit and look at all the silent company until it was time to go to bed. So there's this woman who's been sitting and, and, and working, and he assumed he thought it was Mr. Peggotty's wife. So, but he says, no, I'm a bachelor, <laughs> or I'm a bachelor, meaning I'm not married. And Davy says, who's that? And, and uh, Mr. Peggotty says, oh, that's Mrs. Gummidge. So Mrs., that means that she's married. And, but then his Peggotty, his nanny, went, stop talking about that. Don't, don't ask any questions. So he really wanted to know more about it, but he stopped. He stopped because Peggotty told him to. Okay, and then everybody was quiet for the rest of the time until it was time to go to bed. Okay, let's see. Uh, then in the privacy of my own little cabin, she informed me that Ham and Emily were an orphan nephew and niece whom my host had at different times adopted in their childhood when they were left destitute. So uh, these children, Ham and Emily, are not Mr. Peggotty's but they are his nieces and nephews, and their parents are dead, they're orphans, and they were destitute, meaning they didn't have any place to stay, they didn't have any money, so he adopted them and he took them in. And that Mrs. Gummidge was the widow of his partner in a boat who had died very poor. So Mrs. Gummidge was married to uh, Mr. Peggotty's partner. So they owned a boat together. Mr. Peggotty and Mr. Gummidge owned a, part, uh, a boat together. But one day Mr. Gummidge died in the sea. He drowned. But he didn't have any money, so Mrs. Gummidge was also destitute. But uh, Mr. Peggotty adopted her and took her in, and she was living there with him. Uh, let's see. So Mrs. Gummidge was the widow of his partner in a boat who had died very poor. He was but a poor man himself, said Peggotty, but as good as gold and as true as steel. Those were her similes. The only subject she informed me on which he ever showed a violent temper or swore an oath was this generosity of his. And if it were ever referred to by any one of them, he struck the table a heavy blow with his right hand. The only subject... I have to read this again because I'm not sure about what it means. The, uh, the only subject she informed me on which he had ever showed a violent temper or swore an oath was this generosity of his. And if it were ever referred to by any of them, he struck the, tab the, the table a heavy blow with his right hand, uh, had split it on one such occasion, and swore a dreadful oath that he would be gorned if he didn't cut and run for good, if it was ever mentioned again. So, I don't know about this word gorned, but uh, I think they're describing the brother, Peggotty's brother, and saying he, he's a very nice man. And the only time he ever got angry was when one of the children or Mrs. Gummidge mentioned their appreciation for what he was doing for them. And it made him so angry. He said, if you ever mention this again, I'll leave you. I'll leave you all here. So he doesn't, he doesn't like people to thank him for what he's doing. He doesn't want that. So, uh, okay, that's pretty interesting. All right. Uh, and he swore an oath that he would be gormed to be gormed. Let me see what that means, to be gormed. Meaning. 
No, Google doesn't even tell me. It says, oh, did you mean formed? I think it's some kind of slang that they would use in that part of England at that time. I think it might mean goddamned. That's my guess. I'll be gormed. I think so. If he didn't cut and run for good. So he, he would run away if anybody ever mentioned it again. It appeared, in answer to my inquiries, that nobody had the least idea of the etymology of this terrible verb, passive, to be gormed. Okay, so even they don't know what it means. But I think it means like goddamned. <laughs> but they all regarded it as constituting a most solemn imprecation. So, so they didn't know what it meant. They didn't know what that word meant. Neither do I. But they, they guessed it meant uh, something very strong. And so they don't, they don't talk about it anymore. I was very sensible of my entertainer's goodness and listened to the women's going to bed and another little crib like mine at the opposite end of the boat. And to him and Ham hanging up the two hammocks for themselves on hooks, I had noticed in the roof, in a very luxurious state of mind, enhanced by my being sleepy. As slumber gradually stole upon me, I heard the wind howling out at the sea and coming on across the flat so fiercely that I had a lazy apprehension of the great deep rising in the night. But I bethought myself that I was in a boat, after all, and that a man like Mr. Peggotty was not a bad person to have on board if anything did happen. So he was a little bit scared because, you know, they're next to the ocean on the beach in this boat and the wind is blowing. But then he reminded himself that he was in very good company. And if anything bad happened, Mr. Peggotty would be the, the, the best person to take care of any problem. Nothing happened, however, worse than morning. Almost as soon as it shone upon the oyster shell frame of my mirror, I was out of bed and out with little Emily picking up stones upon the beach. You're quite a sailor, I suppose, I said to a Emily. I don't know that I supposed anything of the kind, but I felt it an act of gallantry to, be, to say something, and a shining sail close to us made such a pretty little image of itself at the moment in her bright eye that it came into my head to say this. No, Emily, sh uh, no, Emily shaking her head. No, replied Emily, shaking her head. I'm afraid of the sea. Afraid? I said with a becoming air of boldness and looking very big at the mighty ocean. I ain't. Oh, but it's cruel, said Emily. I've seen it very cruel to some of our men. I've seen it tear a boat as big as our house all to pieces. I hope it wasn't the boat that that father was drowned in, said Emily. No, not that one. I never see that boat. Nor him, I asked. Little Emily shook her head. Not to remember. Here was a coincidence. Immediately, I immediately went into an explanation how I had never seen my own father, and how my mother and I had always lived by ourselves in the happiest state imaginable. And lived so then, and always meant to live so, and how my father's grave was in the churchyard near our house, and shaded by a tree, beneath the boughs of, the, uh, of which I had walked and heard the birds sing many a pleasant morning. But there were some differences between Emily's orphaning Oh. But there were some differences between Emily's orphanhood and mine, it appeared. She lost her mother before her father, and where her father's grave was no one and where her father's grave one was no one knew, except that it was somewhere in the depths of the sea. Besides, said Emily, as she looked out for shells and pebbles, your father was a gentleman, and your mother is a lady. And my father was a fisherman, and my mother was a fisherman's daughter. And my uncle Dan is a fisherman. Dan is Mr. Peggotty, is he? 
said I. Uncle Dan, yonder. Remember, yonder means over there. It's not used very much anymore, but sometimes you might hear it. Uncle Dan, yonder. And so Uncle Dan, over there, answered Emily, nodding at the boathouse. Yes, I mean him. He must be very good, I should think. Good, said Emily. If I was ever to be a lady, I'd give him a sky blue coat with diamond buttons, nanking trousers, a red velvet waistcoat, a cocked hat, a large gold watch, a silver pipe, and a box of money. I said I had no doubt that Mr. Peggotty well deserved these treasures. I must acknowledge that I felt it difficult to picture him quite, quite at his ease in the raiment proposed for him by his grateful little niece, and that I was particularly doubtful of the policy of the cocked hat. Cocked, if, if you cock something, it means you, you turn it a little bit to the side. So if you, if you put a hat on like this, uh, that's how you would expect a hat to be, but a cocked hat would be off to the side a little bit. So uh, I, partic I was particularly doubtful about the policy of the cocked hat, but I kept these sentiments to myself. Little Emily had stopped and looked up at the sky in her en enumeration of these articles, as if they were a glorious vision. We went on again, picking up shells and pebbles, you would like to be a lady, I said. Emily looked at me and laughed and nodded. Yes, I should like it very much. We would all be gentle folks together then. Me and Uncle and Ham and Mrs. Gummidge. We wouldn't mind then when there were, uh, when there comes stormy weather. Not for our own sakes, I mean. We, we would for the fishermen's to be sure and we'd help them with money when they when they come out to any hurt this seemed to me to be a very satisfactory and therefore not at all improbable picture i expressed my pleasure in the contemplation of it and little emily was emboldened to say shyly don't you think you're afraid of the sea now it was quite enough to reassure me, but I have no doubt if I had seen a moderately large wave come tumbling in. And remember, there's that word tumbling. We had tumbling down, which means something was standing, and if it fell, it would it would go down like that. But oh wait, my my camera's over here. I have to get used to that. Uh, so tumble down is something is standing, and then it falls and goes like that. That's how it falls. So it's like fall down, except you have this movement of tumbling. Tumbling in would mean like the waves coming into the land. So the waves don't just move like this. The waves move like this. So they say tumbling in. So Emily says, don't you think you're afraid of the sea now? It was quite enough to reassure me, but I have no doubt if I had seen a moderately large wave tumbling in, I should have taken my heels with an awful recollection of her drowned relations. I should have taken to my heels. I should have taken to my heels uh, with a an awful recollection of her drowned relations. However, I said no, and I added, you don't seem to be either, though you say you are. For she was walking much too near the brink of the sort of old jetty or wooden causeway we had strolled upon, and I was afraid of her falling over. I'm not afraid in this way, said little Emily, but I wake when it blows, and tremble to think of Uncle Dan and Ham, and I believe I hear him crying out for help. That's why I should like so much to be a lady, but I'm not afraid in this way, not a bit. Look here. And she started from she started from my side and ran, ran along a jagged timber which protruded from the place we stood upon and overhung the deep water at home at some height without the least defense. So she's walking on a piece of wood. She's kind of walking on a piece of wood, and I guess it's just over the ocean. Something like that. The incident is so impressed on my remembrance that if I were a, a draftsman, 
I could draw I could draw its form here, I dare say accurately, as if it was that day. So he's saying it was such a crazy thing to see. She gets on this board and she starts walking and I guess it's it's just right over the ocean that he says, I can still remember it now. And if I were able to draw, if I, if I had that talent or that skill of drawing pictures, I could draw it exactly as it was, even now. And little Emily springing forward to her destruction, as it appeared to me, with a look that I have never forgotten, directed out to the sea. So he was even imagining her falling in. She didn't fall in, but he was imagining that and what her face would look like. The light, bold, fluttering little figure turned and came back safe to me, and I soon laughed at my fears and at the cry I had uttered, fruitlessly in any case, for there was no one near. But there have been times since in my manhood, many times there have been, when I thought, is it possible among the possibilities of hidden things that in the sudden rashness of a child and her wild looks so far off, that there was any merciful attraction of her into any danger, any tempting her towards him permitting... Oh, wait. Now, I just want to stop because I want to talk about this word rash or rashness. Rash could mean several things, but rashness could only mean one thing. So we'll put this word up here. Uh, th this sentence is a little bit confusing, but let, now let's just take a look at the definition of rashness. I think that means doing something in a hurry without thinking, but let's see how Google defines it. Being careless or unwise without thought what might happen or the result. So to be rash is to be very careless and do something. I would say in kind of a hurry, making a rash decision is making a bad decision very quickly. It's a very common uh, expression to make a rash decision. All right, so let's let's go back over this. Where do, where does it say rashness? The oh, where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. I have thought, is it possible among the possibilities of hidden things that in the sudden rashness of the child and her wild look so far off? So is it possible that in her carelessness and her wild, her wild eyes, uh, there was any merciful attraction of her into danger? Any tempting her towards him permitted on the part of her dead father that her life might have a chance of ending that day? That's very complicated, but I think what he's saying is, I was wondering later on, not at the moment when he was a child and this incident happened, but later on, maybe she was doing this unconsciously because she wanted to die. I think that's kind of what he's saying. He's saying it in a very weird way, <laughs> or a very uh, interesting way, I guess we should say. But I think that's what he's saying. Okay, let's see. There has been a time since when I have wondered whether if the life before her could have been revealed to me at a glance, and so revealed as that a child could fully comprehend it, and if her preservation could have depended on a motion of my hand, I ought to have held it up to save her. There has been a time since I have wondered whether if the life before her could have been revealed to me at a glance, and so revealed as a child could have fully comprehended it, and if her preservation could have depended on a motion of my hand, I ought to have held it up to save her. So later on, he wondered, 
maybe he was thinking to himself, I'm so stupid. Why didn't I grab her? What if she died that day and it's because I didn't grab her? So it's kind of like a weird regret that he has. Like maybe what's wrong with me? Why didn't I save her? There's been a time since, I do not say it lasted long, but it has been when I've asked myself the question, would it have been better for little Emily to have waters close above, close above her, close above her head that morning in my sight? And when I've answered yes, it would have been. This may be premature. I have set it down too soon, perhaps, but let it stand. So, you know, he's writing this or he's talking about this as an adult. And as he's talking about it, he's saying, maybe it would have been better if she had died that day, if she had fallen into the ocean that day and died because of whatever happens to her later. And then he's saying, oh, I'm getting way ahead. I'm telling you too much now, but oh well. We strolled a long way, and I think we had that word stroll in the last chapter. It means going for a walk, going for a nice little walk. We strolled a long way and loaded ourselves with things that we thought curious and put some stranded starfish carefully back into the water. I hardly know enough of the race at this moment to be quite certain whether they had reason to feel obliged to us for doing so or the reverse. and then made our way home to Mr. Peggotty's dwelling. We stepped under... We stepped... We stopped under the lee of the lobster outhouse. I don't know what a lee is. But a lobster outhouse must be where they... A, a place where they keep the lobsters outside of the house to exchange an innocent kiss and went into breakfast glowing with health and pleasure. Like two young mavishes, like two young mavishes. What's a mavish? So this is Peggy. Mavish. Well, in the dictionary, it says that it is a dialectical British variant of Mavis, but I don't know what a Mavis is. What is a Mavis? Song thrush? I don't know what that is. Song thrush. An old word thrush that is largely brown above the spotted white underparts. What? Uh, no, I don't know. This is just sending me in circles. I don't know what a Mavis is. I don't know what a Mavish is. But I guess it's something cute or something like that. Because uh, Peggotty says, Mr. Peggotty says, Like two young Mavishes. I knew this meant in our local dialect. Oh, now he's going to explain. I, I, knew, I, knew what, I knew this meant in our local dialect. Like two young thrushes. Well, that's the other word in the dictionary, but I'm not sure what that is. And received it as a compliment. Okay. Well, it's now it's annoying me. Let's put a thrush. It's a type of bird. So, uh, like two little birds. Okay, of course, I was in love with Emily. I'm sure I loved that baby quite as truly, quite as tenderly, with greater purity and more disinterestedness than can enter into the best love of a later time of life, high and ennobling as it is. I'm sure my fancy raised up something round the blue-eyed might of a child, which etherealized and made a very, a very angel of her. If any sunny forenoon she had spread a little pair of wings and flown away before my eyes, I don't think I should have regarded it as much more than I had reason to expect. Oh, so he's saying, I, I was in love with her, I thought she was an angel, and if she 
She grew wings and flew away. That wouldn't surprise him because he already thought of her as an angel. We used to walk about that dim old flat at Yarmouth in a loving manner, hours and hours. The days sported by us as if time had not grown up himself. Yet, but were a child too. The days sported by us as if time had not grown up himself yet, but were a child too. Days sported by, the days went by us very quickly as if time had not grown up himself, as if time hadn't been mature, but was also still a child and was always at play. I told Emily I adored her and that unless she confessed she adored me, I should be reduced to the necessity of killing myself with a sword. So this is a little kid saying, if you don't tell me that you love me, I'm going to kill myself. She said she did, and I have no doubt that she did. As to any sense of inequality or youthfulness or other difficulty in our way, little Emily and I had no such trouble because we had no future. We made no more provision for growing older than we did for growing younger. We were the admiration of Mrs. Gummidge and Peggotty, who used to whisper of an evening when we sat lovingly in our little locker side by side. Lore, wasn't it beautiful? Mr. Peggotty smiled at us from behind his pipe, and Ham grinned all the evening and did nothing else. They had something of the sort of pleasure in us, I suppose, that they might have had in a toy or a pocket model of the Coliseum. I soon found out that Mrs. Gummidge did not always make herself so agreeable as she might have been expected to do. So he's saying, I, I soon discovered that Mrs. Gummidge wasn't always very nice to people. Or, or nice to be around. Under the circumstances of her residence with Mr. Peggotty, Mrs. Gummidge's was rather a fretful disposition, and she whimpered more sometimes than was comfortable for other parties in so small an establishment. So Mrs. Gummidge was a rather fretful disposition. Mrs. Gummidge's was a rather fretful disposition. Fretful Fret, that word fret means worry. And so a fretful disposition means maybe she's always nervous, always worried. And she whimpers. Whimpering is kind of a, a type of crying. Like, oh, oh, that's kind of whimpering. More sometimes than was comfortable for, and it made people uncomfortable. It's such a small place, that boat, that uh, it was hard to avoid her. So you could hear her oh, all the time, and it, it sometimes was a very uncomfortable situation. I was very sorry for her, but there were moments when it would have been more agreeable, I thought, if Mrs. Gummidge had had a convenient apartment of her own to retire to and had stopped there. Oh, that's an until. The printing's a little bad on here, and I can't tell. I thought that was like untie with a colon, but it's until. So uh, let me read that over. Mrs. Gummidge had had a convenient apartment of her own to retire to, and had stopped there until her spirits revived. Mr. Peggotty went occasionally to a public house called The Willing Mind. I discovered this by his being out on the second or third evening of our visit, and by Mrs. Gummidge's looking up at the Dutch clock between eight and nine and saying he was there and that what was more, she had known in the morning he would go there. So she was looking at the clock saying, oh yeah, he's at the pub. And I knew this morning he was going to the pub. Mrs. Gummidge had been in a low state all day and had burst into tears in the forenoon when the fire smoked. 
I'm a lone, lorn creature, <laughs> were Mrs. Gummidge's words when that unpleasant occurrence took place. And every think, and every think goes contrary with me. Oh, it'll soon leave off, said Peggotty. I again mean our Peggotty. And besides, you know, it's not more disagreeable to you than to us. I feel it more, said Mrs. Gummidge. It was a very cold day with cutting blasts of wind. Mrs. Gummidge's peculiar corner of the fireside seemed to be the warmest and snuggest. There's that word, that word snug again, the snuggest, the most comfortable, nicest, warmest place in the whole place. And her chair was certainly the easiest. But it didn't suit her that day at all. She was constantly complaining of the cold and of its occasioning a visitation in her back, which she called the creeps. So, uh, so she, when uh, she would feel uncomfortable in her back and she called those the creeps. So she was saying, oh no, I'm getting the creeps again. My pain, pain in my back. At last, she shed tears on the subject and said again, that she was a lone, lorn creature, and every think went contrary with her. Every thought, I guess, or every idea, or something like that. It's certainly very cold, said Peggotty. Everybody must feel it. I feel it more than other people, said Mrs. Gummidge. So at dinner, when Mrs. Gummidge was always helped immediately after me, to whom the preference was given as the visitor of distinction. So uh, when they were having dinner, Davy was, was served first because he was the guest, but then Mrs. Gummidge was always second. The fish were small and bony, and the potatoes were, little, were a little burnt. We all acknowledged that we felt this something of a disappointment, but Mrs. Gummidge said she felt it more than we did and shed tears again and made the former declaration with great bitterness. So so she, she started crying because the potatoes were a little burnt and the fish wasn't that good. Accordingly, when Mr. Peggotty came home about nine o'clock, this unfortunate Mrs. Gummidge was knitting in her corner in a very wretched and miserable condition. Peggotty had been working cheerfully Ham had been patching up a great pair of water boots, and I, with little Emily by my side, had been reading to them. Mrs. Gummidge had never made any other remark than a forlorn sigh, <sighs> a sigh, and had never raised her eyes since tea. Well, mates, said Mr. Peggotty, taking his seat, how are you? We all said something or looked something to welcome him except Mrs. Gummidge, who shook her head over her knitting. What's amiss? That word amiss means what's wrong. What's the problem? What's amiss? Said Mr. Peggotty, with a clap of his hands. Cheer up, old Mulder. Mr. Peggotty meant old girl. Mrs. Gummidge did not appear to be able to cheer up. She took out an old black silk handkerchief and wiped her eyes, but instead of putting it in her pocket, kept it out and wiped them again and still kept it out, ready for use. What's a miss, dame? said Mr. Peggotty. Nothing, returned Mrs. Gummidge. You've come from the willing mind, Daniel? Why, yes, I took a short spell at the willing mind tonight, said Mr. Peggotty. A spell is a period of time. So I took, I've took, I took a short spell means I spent a little time at the willing mind. <laughs> and then uh, Mrs. Gummidge says, I'm sorry I should drive you there. Meaning, so he went there to drink alcohol and Mrs. Gummidge thinks that the reason he's drinking alcohol is because he can't stand to be around her. So she says, I'm sorry that me being here makes you go there. I'm sorry I should drive you there, says Mrs. Gummidge. Drive? 
I don't want no driving, returned Mr. Peggotty with an honest laugh. I only go too ready. <laughs> so he's saying, you're not, you're not, you're not forcing me to go there. It's not because of you I go there. I go there because I like it. Very ready, said Mrs. Gummidge, shaking her head and wiping her eyes. Yes, yes, very ready. I'm sorry it should be along of me. Uh, it should be along of me that you're so ready. I'm not sure what they mean by that, along of me. Along of you? It ain't along of you, said Mr. Peggotty. Don't ye believe a bit on it. And so I think maybe that's like because of me. Like So because of you? It's not because of you, said Mr. Peggotty. Don't ye believe a bit on it. So don't even think about that. Don't even consider that. Yes, yes, it is, cried Mrs. Gummidge. I know what I am. I know that I'm a lone, lorn creature. And not only that, everything, everything goes contrary with me. But then I go contrary with everybody. Yes, yes, I feel more than other people do. I know. I show it more. It's my misfortune. I really couldn't help thinking as I sat taking in all this, that the misfortune extended to some other members of the family besides Mrs. Gummidge. But Mr. Peggotty made no such retort, only answering with another entreaty to Mrs. Gummidge to cheer up. I ain't what I could wish myself to be, said Mrs. Gummidge. I'm far from it. I know what I am. My troubles has made me contrary. So she's saying, I, I'm not the person who I want to be. I'm not anything like the person I want to be. And I know, I, I can see how miserable, I can see how other people see me, that I'm horrible. My troubles, my, my problems, my history has made me this way. I feel my troubles, and they make me contrary. I feel my troubles, and uh, I, I feel all these horrible things that happen to me, and it makes it so other people don't like me. That's why people don't like me. It's because I'm always thinking about these horrible things that happen to me. I wish I didn't feel them, but I do. I wish I could be hardened to them, but I ain't. So I wish... Uh, I wish I couldn't feel these horrible feelings, but I do. I wish I wish they could make me stronger, but they don't. I make the house uncomfortable. I don't wonder at it. I've made your sister so all day, and Master Davy. So I've made everybody miserable all day. Here I was suddenly melted and roared out, No, you haven't, Mrs. Gummidge, in a great mental distress. It's far from right that I should do it, said Mrs. Gummidge. It ain't fit. It ain't a fit return. I'd better go into the house and die. I'm a lone, lorn creature, and had much better not make myself contrary here. If things must go contrary with me, and I must go contrary myself, let me go contrary in my in, the, in my parish. Let me go contrary in my parish. Daniel, I better go into the house and die and be a riddance. Mrs. Gummidge retired with these words and betook herself to bed. When she was gone, Mr. Peggotty, who had not exhibited a trace of any feeling but the profoundest sympathy, looked round upon us and nodding his head with a lively expression of that sentiment still animating his face, said in a whisper, She's been thinking of the old one. She's been thinking of her husband. I did not quite understand what old one Mr. Gummidge, what Mrs. Gummidge was supposed to have fixed her mind upon until Peggotty, on seeing me to bed, explained that it was the late Mr. Gummidge. A lot of times when people will add the word late to the name of a person, that means that they died. So if you say the late Mr. Gummidge, that means uh, Mr. Gummidge is dead. And that her brother always took that for a received truth upon such occasions, and that it's always had a moving effect upon him. Sometime after he was in his hammock that night, I heard myself repeat to Ham, Poor thing. Oh, I heard him myself repeat to Ham, Poor thing. 
she's been thinking of the old un. And whenever Mrs. Gummidge was overcome in a similar manner during the remainder of our stay, which happened some few times, he always said the same thing in, ext in extenuation of the circumstance, and always with the tenderest commiseration. So the fortnight slipped away. Okay, we've got this phrasal verb here, slipped away. Slip away is when something is disappearing and maybe you don't notice that it's disappearing. So it could be going very fast and you don't see it because it's going very fast. Or it's disappearing so slowly that you don't see it. When something slips away, it, it, it's escaping you. It's moving away from you. And so when he says that the fortnight, remember a fortnight is two weeks and Davy is only spending two weeks there. He's saying that the fortnight slipped away. It means he didn't even notice that it was leaving. Suddenly, there's only one day left or two days left. And he didn't even think about it because so many things were happening. He didn't even see it happening. He didn't see, he didn't see the two weeks disappearing. And suddenly he was surprised that the time was over with. Well, let's read the sentence again. So, this, the, so the fortnight slipped away. That means it, it, it went away. I didn't even see it leaving. And suddenly I said, it's gone? Where did it go? It slipped away. So the fortnight slipped away, varied by nothing but the variation of the tide, which altered Mr. Peggotty's times of going out and coming in, and altered Ham's engagements also. When the latter was unemployed, he sometimes walked with us to show us the boats and the ships, and once or twice he took us for a row. I don't know why one slight set of impressions should be more particularly associated with a place than another, though, though I believe this obtains, the most pe this obtains with most people, in reference especially to the associations of their childhood. I never hear the name or read the name of Yarmouth, but I am reminded of a certain Sunday morning on the beach, the bells ringing for church, little Emily leaning on my shoulder, Ham lazily dropping stones into the water, and the sun away at sea, just breaking through the heavy mist and showing us the ships like their own shadows. As the last day came for going home, I bore up against the separation from Mr. Peggotty and Mrs. Gummidge, but my agony of mind at leaving little Emily was piercing. We went arm in arm to the public house where the carrier put up. I promised on the road to write to her. I redeemed that promise afterwards in characters larger than those in which apartments are usually announced in a manuscript as being to let. We were greatly overcome at parting, and if ever in my life I have had a void made in my heart, I had one made, I had one made that day. Now, all the time I had been on my visit, I had been ungrateful to my home again. All the time that I had been on my visit, I had been ungrateful to my home again, and had thought little or nothing about it. But I was no sooner turned towards it than my reproachful young conscious, conscience seemed to point that way with a steady finger, and I felt all the more for sinking uh, of my spirits, that it was my nest, and that my mother was my comforter and friend. This gained upon me as we went along. So the nearer we drew, the more familiar the objects became that we passed. The more excited I was to get there and to run into her arms. But Peggotty, instead of sharing in these transports, tried to check them, though very kindly, and looked confused and cut of sorts. Blunderstone Rookery 
would come, however, in spite of her when the carrier's horse pleased and did. How well I recollect it on a cold gray afternoon with a dull sky, threatening rain. The door opened and I looked half laughing and half crying in my pleasant agitation for my mother. It was not she, but a strange servant. Why, Peggotty, I said ruefully, isn't she come home? Yes, yes, Master Davy, said Peggotty. She's come home. Wait a bit, Master Davy, and I'll, I'll tell you something. Between her agitation and her natural awkwardness in getting out of the cart, <laughs> Peggotty was making a most extraordinary festoon of herself, but I, I felt too blank and strange to tell her so. When she had got down, she took me by the hand, led me wondering into the kitchen, and shut the door. Peggotty, said I, quite frightened, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter, bless you, Master Davy dear, she answered, assuming an air of sprightliness. Something's the matter, I'm sure. Where's Mama? Where's Mama, Master Davy? repeated Peggotty. Yes, why hasn't she come out of the gate? And what have we come in here for? Oh, Peggotty, my eyes were full, and I felt as if I was going to tumble down. Tumble down. Bless the precious boy, cried Peggotty, taking hold of me. What is it? Speak, my pet. Not dead, too. Oh, she's not dead, Peggotty. Peggotty cried out with an astonishing volume of voice, and then sat down and began to pant, and said, I've given her a turn. I gave her a hug to take away the turn, or to give her another turn in the right direction. I then stood before her, looking uh, at her dumb, looking at her in dumb inquiry. You see, dear, I should have told you before now, said Peggotty, but I hadn't an opportunity. I ought to have made it, perhaps, but I couldn't exactly. That was always the substitute. I didn't read it. Exactly. Which he says that was his substitute for exactly. And Peggotty's militia of words. Bring my mind to it. Go on, Peggotty, says I, more frightened than ever. Master Davy, said Peggotty, untying her bonnet with her shaking hand and speaking in a breathless sort of way. What do you think? You've got a paw. I trembled and turned white. Something I don't know what or how, connected with the grave and the churchyard and the raising of the dead, seemed to strike me like an unwholesome wind. A new one, said Peggotty. A new one, I repeated. Peggotty gave a gasp, as if she were swallowing something that was very hard, and putting out her hand and said, Come and see him. I don't want to see him. And your mamma, said Peggotty. I ceased to draw back, and we went straight to the best parlor, where she left me. One side of the fire, on one side of the fire sat my mother. On the other side, Mr. Murdston, my mother, dropped her work and arose, hurriedly but timidly, I thought. Now, Clara, my dear, said Mr. Murdston, recollect, control yourself. Always control yourself. Davy boy, how do you do? I gave him my hand. After a moment of suspense, I went and kissed my mother. She kissed me, patted me gently on the shoulder, and sat down again to her work. I could not look at her. I could not look at him. I knew quite well that he was looking at us both. And I turned to the window and looked out there at some shrubs that were drooping their heads in the cold. As soon as I could creep away, I crept upstairs. My old dear bedroom was changed and I was to lie a long way off. I rambled down the stairs to find anything that was like itself, so altered it all seemed, and roamed into the yard. I very soon started back. 
I very soon started back from there, for the empty dog kennel was filled up with a great dog, deep-mouthed and black-haired, like him. And he was very angry at the sight of me, and sprung out, and sprung out at me. Okay, and that is the end of chapter three of David Copperfield. So next time we are going to start chapter four.